Welcome back. And the topic this week, uh, although it's a little bit long, it contains a long list, uh, we may not uh, go through everything, but I wanted to put a little bit of an emphasis on a review of density matrix matrices and measurements, which we discussed last week, and also bring back uh, some of the exercises which we discussed last week. Because the idea behind these exercises is that we are going to reuse them in the first project. And I was planning to have that available by the end of next week, because next week we would like to discuss a little bit about gates and some simple simulations. Now, the exercises which we had last week are also exercises which we are going to reuse today. And today, we are going to use that qubit system, this two qubit system, and we are going to calculate the density matrix of a subsystem. And with that, we are going to calculate what's called the von Neumann entropy. Uh, we are going to see how far we get, but with the von Neumann entropy, we can then say something about entanglement. So these are also things which I need to discuss today, what we actually mean by entanglement. These are fundamental features of quantum mechanical systems. And most of you have probably encountered these concepts in basic quantum mechanics courses, but we are going to define them. For some of you, these are well-known things. And depending on how far we get, we may have to push some of the material till next week. So the plan today is a little bit over ambitious. But let's quickly remind ourselves uh, about uh, some of the things we did last week. And I also wanted to say a little bit about the motivation. So in order to study entanglement, we are going to need many of these small ingredients, which we brought up last time. We discussed the density matrix. We discussed what's called a spectral decomposition of an operator, which is uh, one of these technicalities, which you will see again and again. And then, uh, we are going now to practice by looking at the simple two qubit systems. And one of the reasons for that is that this is a system we can think of as two idealized, independent and distinguishable systems. Essentially, all physical systems are strongly interacting or weakly interacting, which means that the whole concept of a distinguishable and separate system is something which normally does not hold ground. So what we mean by that is something which we will come back to again and again. So one of the things which we discussed last time was actually the spectral decomposition of an operator, which means that uh, if we have the eigenvalues of the operator and the eigenbasis, we can expand a given operator in terms of the projection operator here of the states i. So these i's are orthogonal and normalized bases, and they are eigenstates of this operator a, and these are the eigenvalues. This is something which we will use when we define the density matrix as well. So this kind of uh, outer products, which we have in this equation, is something which we will use many, many times in this course. You can generalize this to uh, an operator, which is a function of that one. And that's something we can rewrite like this. And then we also defined uh, the traces of operators. Uh, one thing we should keep in mind is that the trace of an operator, A, B, and C, is something which is cyclic, which means again, that we can rewrite it like that. And that means that when we take the trace of let's say this quantity here, then we can actually rewrite it like this. Oh yeah, sorry, it should be F or lambda, sorry, thanks. If you spot typos, please let me know. Thanks, That's, I didn't see that before now, actually. Then the other thing which we went through last time is the uh, definition of the density matrix. So this density matrix could be any state we are interested in. And that state can be represented as a linear combination of these uh, orthogonal states. And this P of I is now the probability of being in that specific state. And we are going to see some specific examples of that later today. 
So the trace of a density matrix is so that it sums to one, as we discussed last time. And it's also invariant under unitary transformations. So unitary transformations are the type of transformations which we'll always will deal with. So when you have this symbol here, this is a, a Michel matrix, whereas this one is normally a, an orthogonal matrix with real matrix elements. So T is just transpose. So this is a, a orthogonal matrix. So if U of dagger here is equal to U of T, then obviously this is a real matrix. And in general, what we have is that when we perform this operation here, then we end up with this set of equations, which we then, when we, the, when we have the unitary transformation, it's actually easy to show that the trace of the transform density matrix is actually equal to one. So when we transform it, then we know that this operation here has to be satisfied. This has to be equal to one because this is a unitary matrix. And then we see that that is automatically equal to one. So the uh, trace is conserved. Uh, vector pro uh, properties like orthogonality and the norm is also conserved when we perform a unitary transformation. Yeah? Just say stop. This one? Okay, so one of the things I wanted to bring up now is uh, the set of exercises we discussed last week. And uh, one of the things which we also had last week was that Karen presented how you could start coding some of these properties. But I wanted to bring them up because what we are going to do today is to uh, calculate the entropy of one of the subsystems. So. Let me bring back the notebook from last week. And if we scroll down to the end here, after all these definitions, which we, so last time we went through the spectral decomposition, we discussed measurements, and we discussed uh, the density matrix, etc., And then we discussed also the type of Hamiltonians, which we are going to look at. Now, there are many reasons why I bring this up. One is because these are elements which will enter the first project. We are actually going to simulate some of these Hamiltonians on a quantum computer, and we're also going to make our own program to find like the eigenvalues of such a system. So it's pretty common that we split the Hamiltonian into a part, which we call the non-interacting part. And this is often a part which we can solve analytically. So this is pretty common in many body physics. So this H0 would, for example, be an harmonic oscillator, a particle moving in a harmonic oscillator trap, which are traps which are used to realize actually specific uh, quantum computers. So you have ion traps, you have quantum dot systems, and these can be idealized like particles moving in a harmonic oscillator-like potential. That is the first a type of approximation which we can make. So in that case, uh, we know the solution to this piece and we can construct an orthogonal and normalized basis, which we then can use to expand the exact solution in terms of. So that's a basic technique in all of many body physics. And then we have the interaction piece. So the solution is normally expanded in terms of a basis here. And you will encounter these kind of ways of thinking when we discuss an algorithm which is used to simulate quantum mechanical systems and quantum computers, and that's called the variational quantum eigensolver, or VQE. That's one of the algorithms we are going to implement in the first project. So uh, what we did then, if we just take away some of these things, and look at the, uh, the basis set which we have, we looked at uh, one, a very simple Hamiltonian. And one of these sets of systems could then be described in terms of a one qubit case. So we had a two by two matrix, which then represents a qubit zero and a qubit one. 
This can be a single particle system, but it can also be a complicated many particle system where we just take away all other states than the two lowest ones. So that means we have an effective Hamiltonian, which is described in terms of two states only. But we are using this more for pedagogical reasons now. And uh, the, the system we had was a system where we know the solution to this case. So H0 has E0 as an eigenvalue and zero as an eigenvector, and the same here. And this is given by a two by two matrix, which typically can be a combination of Pauli matrices. And the sigma C matrix is typically the one which we would use because that has the qubit zero. If we think of that as a vector one zero, that has that one as an eigen vector with an eigenvalue plus one. And the other qubit, qubit one, has eigenvalue minus one because we're using the sigma C matrix. So let me quickly remind you of that so that you have these kind of elements clear. So if you look at this Hamiltonian, which we are setting up now, we are assuming that this is the case. So this is a very simple system. And then we are putting up some kind of interaction matrix elements. And there is a diagonal element and there is a non-diagonal element. And the diagonal one, we have this X0, the X1, and then we have the cross matrix elements. And since this is meant to be a symmetric matrix, then uh, we just give the same value here. So this is uh, almost an offense to present to you guys, but we know that we can solve this one exactly. This is a pretty easy problem to solve. But let me quickly remind you of why this is interesting per se and how this is going to enter the first project. Because this is a Hamiltonian, which we can rewrite in terms of Pauli matrices. So there's an exercise at the end here where I actually put in the solution and hope you don't again get offended, but you, uh, you can actually rewrite this Hamiltonian in terms of the identity matrix, a Pauli C matrix and a Pauli X matrix for the non-diagonal matrix elements. So this is the way you can rewrite a Hamiltonian, which looks like this. It has a part, which we know the solution to, and then there is the interacting part. And this is the one we need to plug in in order to diagonalize. This is normally called in many body physics. It has a name. It's called configuration interaction theory, which means that you have a, a configurations. Qubit zero is a configuration and qubit one is a configuration. And then there is an interaction between state one and state zero. And then there are self interactions between the states. For those of you who have done nuclear physics, this is normally called the nuclear shell model. But the normally money body physics, this is called the shell model. But let me just remind you of one small thing here, because this is actually important. So one thing uh, which we will typically do is to rewrite the Hamiltonian in terms of the Pauli matrices, which means that uh, the reason for doing that is that the Pauli matrices are ways we represent different quantum gates, which means that your simulation of a quantum mechanical system is given by a couple set of gates and it defines a circuit. So as a quantum circuit and every Hamiltonian or every algorithm you want to implement has its own circuits. So you can think of this as a kind of quantum compiler where you actually compile and set up a computation according to the Hamiltonian which you have or the type of algorithm you want to implement. So one thing which I wanted to remind you of and this is a kind of notation which we are going to use. We will often use that as a notation, or just Z. And this is given in terms of the matrix minus one, zero, and zero. Now, one thing which is important now is that we have, for this simple case, we have defined an orthogonal and normalized basis, which is given by the state zero, 
which we now simply assume to look like this, and the state one, which we put to zero and one. And what we see immediately is that if I act with sigma z on the state one, zero, this is simply plus one times the state zero. You can see that immediately if you just act with one, zero, one minus one on one, zero. So you could say that this projects act actually out this state here. Then if we act with this on one, we get simply minus one multiplied with one. That's also pretty easy to see if you just perform the vector matrix multiplication. Now, these are actually two important results because that tells us that these states are also eigenstates of the sigma C matrix. So when we are rewriting a Hamiltonian, if you have only a diagonal Hamiltonian, then we can rewrite this in terms of quantum circuits, which just contains the sigma C operation. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, this is, uh, this is my bad. Yeah, like that. Thanks. The other thing you will see now, if you apply sigma x, which is equal to zero, one, one, or sigma y, if you apply that one to the state zero or the state one, this is gonna be different from an eigenvalue times zero. And you see that immediately, because if I do this operation, if I take sigma x, and multiply what that with the state zero, I get the state one. And you see that immediately if I do this on zero, I'm actually getting one here. And you can see that by just performing the matrix vector multiplication. So what we are going to see in next during next week and the weeks thereafter is that we are going to rewrite Hamiltonians in terms of these matrices. And they will be useful when we define a quantum computation or what we normally would just call a quantum circuit. So many of the gates can be uh, written out in terms of these matrices. And these matrices are meant to mimic the operations of external probes, for instance, of a, like an electromagnetic field acting on a specific quantum mechanical system. And we are coming back to that. But this was just to give you a kind of motivation for what is going to come. So if I go back here to, the, to that specific exercise, uh, what I could do now is simply to uh, rewrite uh, this matrix, which I have up here, this Hamiltonian matrix in terms of sigma x and sigma z matrices. And then you can choose to have uh, uh, different parameters and I've tuned these parameters so that when I put on this interaction strength, which I let go from zero to one, what I'm going to get is something which I call a level crossing or an avoided level crossing. So what you have here is the strength of the interacting piece. It means that when this strength is zero, I am in the state with qubit zero here and in the state with qubit one. Then when I start putting on the interaction, what is happening then, if we go back to the whiteboard, what we get then is that my solution is going to be a linear combination of the different states. So we have two states. So that means I'm going to have a state psi zero, which will be given by a coefficient alpha zero multiplied with zero plus a beta zero multiplied with one. So now I'm using the property of an orthogonal basis. And then I have the second state. This is for the interacting system. So that means that when I have the full Hamiltonian and I act on psi of i, I get an eigenvalue e of i multiplied with psi of i. And this is going to be equal a coefficient alpha one plus a coefficient beta one multiplied with one. So when the strength 
of the interaction lambda. So what we have done now is actually to rewrite the Hamiltonian in terms of H zero times lambda times an interaction piece, I for interaction. And in our case, lambda goes from zero to one. So when I have lambda equal to zero, then the solution is given by this state for that one, and this state for this one. And then gradually, as I increase the strength of the interaction, then these coefficients change from zero and one to some kind of finite value. Now, this is nothing but a unitary transformation, which means that the norm is preserved, obviously, since these states are already normalized and orthogonal. So the new basis will also be normalized and orthogonal. And you see now that these, if you look at these operations, they represent simply a unitary transformation. So these are in general complex quantities. So just to remind you of that quickly, so you could now write this as a general vector. It has two components and that's given by a unitary matrix, which then multiplies these quantities I here. Okay. And I can be either zero and one. So when you go back then and look at what you have, so let's bring up the Jupyter notebook again. What you see now is that this is a system with what we call an avoided level crossing. So what is going to happen is that the low lying state here changes character. So here it's dominated by state qubit zero. This one is dominated by qubit one, but then it changes character and this is dominated by qubit zero and this is dominated by qubit one. And this is a property which is very important when we are actually going to run quantum computations. So this is something I'm mentioning it now, but this is a property you often are looking after when you are devising quantum operations. Then the next exercise deals with a two qubit system. And this is also something which we will simulate in the first project. So you could obviously say, why are we going to do this? when you can diagonalize a two by two matrix and a four by four matrix. What's the point in bringing in a complicated algorithm just to simulate something you can yeah, barely blink your eye before you have the solution. Now, the reason is that this is our systems which are easy to understand and we can easily rewrite them in terms of poly matrices. So when we come to more realistic systems, these systems are gonna be clearly much more complicated and there will be chains of poly matrices which we need to take into account. So the standard way to rewrite the Hamiltonian is actually in terms of poly matrices. So this is something we will encounter in more detail next week as well. Then uh, we can now make a system which is composed of uh, two qubits. And we can think of these as distinguishable systems. Normally they are not. You could think of two wells where, which, where each traps one particle. So you have well A and well B. And then there is some interaction between the particles in the two wells. So in our case, uh, remember again that uh, these uh, combined two qubit states are tens of products of the individual states. So this gives us a one, zero, zero, and then obviously this has to be zero, one, one, zero, and so on. So this is now a new orthogonal basis. And that new orthogonal basis is a basis which we now simply say that we have an, is an eigenbasis of this H zero. This is something we are making up, okay? But often you're looking after a Hamiltonian which can be split into these two types of parts, one non-interacting, which we know the solution to, and then we can construct an orthogonal basis, and then a part which is the interacting part. And in this case, I'm just gonna make a simple piece here. So since this is going to be a four by four matrix, I simply take the tensor product of two sigma X matrices and two sigma Z matrices. This will give a diagonal element, 
And this will just give the non-diagonal ones by the nature of the Pauli matrices. And then my Hamiltonian looks like this. So later, we are going to use these, this as the density matrix for the ground state. So when you diagonalize, you're going to get these coefficients. So from the diagonalization, every eigenvector has a coefficient alpha zero zero, alpha one one, etc. So if I look only at the lowest state, this is my density matrix. So later today, with the introduction of the concept of entropy, we are going to trace out one of the subsystems and we are going to look at the entropy of the subsystems. And this is used as a measure for entanglement. And you can already with this simple system, you can now see that. So this is a system, as you can see, I have a sigma x, sigma x squared. This is the Kronecker, we discussed that last time. And then we have the non-interacting energies, which um, I just put up some values simply because I wanted to have an avoided level crossing. Oh, say again? Yeah. Yeah. So it's not. No, because this is just the uh, given by the combination of the orthogonal basis you have and the coefficients. So these, co these coefficients are the likelihood for being in that specific component. So when you when you diagonalize now, uh, so let me just bring up, this is, a, this is a good question. So let me just bring this up here. So when you diagonalize uh, for this specific case, uh, you will get a, a ground state, which we call psi zero. This is the lowest line state. And that could now contain a coefficient alpha zero. This is my orthogonal basis. And then I have plus, and then I have uh, alpha one, and then I have zero one plus an alpha two or one zero plus an alpha three or one one. So when you diagonalize, your eigenvectors from the diagonalization are now these coefficients. And that corresponds to a specific eigenvalue. If I look at the next state, these coefficients will be different. And it tells you also which state is the dominating one. So if this alpha zero is 99%, it means that when you square it, the system is essentially in this state. But then with this computational basis, when you increase the strength of the interaction, you mix the other states. So in our case, and this is something to keep in mind, the computational basis is a basis we make up. But when you are looking after the realizations of, uh, let's say, quantum gates, then your basis will often be experimental realizations of a specific system, and they could be the low-lying state of a system. And then you obviously always make a truncation because in principle, you have an infinity of states. Here, we're just dealing with uh, two states for each subsystem, which means that we have four states in total when we have two qubits or two particles. We don't need to have qubits. We could just replace this with two particles, which live, each lives in two states. So if you're familiar with spin in quantum mechanics, this could be a spin up and spin down for particle A and a spin up and spin down for particle B. And that gives you totally a basis with uh, uh, four components. And these components can be made orthogonal to each other like we did here. So the density matrix, if I do that for the ground state, that is the sum it's actually given by the sum of all these kinds of coefficients, alpha i, multiplied with these states. And now I'm going to make a labeling here. So this is just going to be 0. This is going to be 1. This is going to be 2. And this is going to, no, so this is 2. And this is 3. So if you do that, you would now have these four states. 
This is my density matrix. Oh yeah, there will be, sorry. So that's what you meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah clearly. But then when you look at the trace of it, which we are interested in, then it's only the diagonal terms. You're right. That's a good point. Good point, sorry. That's what you meant. Okay. Yeah, I should have, I should have pointed out that one here. So if you now uh, look at this specific system, this is what you will get. So that means that there is an avoided level crossing here. And the state of uh, the state, this, the character of the state here changes when you now move to a strong and strong interacting system. So when we are going to trace out the entropy, you know, the, the density matrix for the subsystem, we are going to use that as a measure of the entropy of the system. So this is just a little bit back to what we did last time. And uh, uh, the exercise we have this week, which will also enter the project, deals with uh, performing this diagonalization, but then also computing the density matrix for the ground state. And then trace out the density matrix for the subsystem and eventually calculate the entropy. So let's see how fast I move now because I've been using a little bit more time. So I'm moving a little bit slowly. I hope you don't mind. And then what I want to do now is actually to switch back to the material we have this week. And I wanted to say something about entanglement here. So I will use a mix of uh, slides and the whiteboard again, uh, but some of the material is on, on the slides here. So if we go back to these two states, which we have, so let me pause a little bit and just move back to the whiteboard. So you could now think, when we now look at the, our first uh, attempt to study entanglement, we are now going to pick up these basis states and you could think of this as a two separate systems. So we could have a, a well here where we trap the particles in the well A. So this is subsystem A. And we have a lowest line state, which we just label with a zero of A, which again is this state one zero. And then we have the next state, which we simple label as qubit one. But then, Depending on this well, so this well could be a finite well, we would have a finite number of states, but typically we neglect those states. So that means that we are going to define a computational basis, which now contains only these two states. Then we have a system B here. So this is system B, and then we have a similar state B, and we have a similar state one for system B, and then we have all these other states, which we just neglect. So it means that our effective Hilbert space is now given by these two systems. And that means again, that the, what the state which we label as zero, zero, which is a sloppy notation or just a compact notation is the same as zero of A tensor product with zero of B. So this is a kind of compact labeling, which we are going to use again and again. And often you will just see this being written out again as a state zero, if it doesn't create confusion. So it means that you would have a numbering where element zero points to zero, zero. The next element may point to zero, one, et cetera, et cetera. So this would be when you write a code, just a kind of internal labeling, which you will have in your software. Okay, any questions? So I'm trying to link the way of thinking to also the way we would write a program. This means that uh, we have these uh, basis states and uh, we discussed that last time. So we uh, uh, have a set of orthogonal states, which uh, look like, so let me just list them here. So this would just be one, zero, zero, zero. I have my state zero, one which is just zero, one, zero, zero. I have my state one, zero, which is going to be given by 
zero, zero, one, zero. And then I have my state one, one, which is just zero, 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 one. And if you look at the orthogonality here, you see that that is immediately baked in here. Now, what we are going to do then is to define a general state, Psi, which will now be a linear combination of these guys. And we are going to look at some specific linear combinations. And these specific linear combinations are also interesting because we are going to make some simple quantum operations with these states next week. And I guess you perhaps, or perhaps you can guess what these states are. They are named after a famous physicist who died too early and should have gotten a Nobel Prize if that person had been alive. So what kind of linear combinations uh, comes to your mind, a famous type of linear combination named after a famous physicist? Bell's equistates. So you can now uh, introduce a linear combination of these specific states. So I'm going to introduce these states. And these states are very interesting ones because they form an orthogonal basis. And they are used in many tests of quantum algorithms. And we are actually gonna meet some of them pretty soon. So you can now define a set of uh, four orthogonal states. And I leave to you to check that these states are orthogonal. So the first one is just one divided by square root of two, and it has a state zero, zero, plus one, one. So one thing you notice now is that these states are not the simple product of one of these orthogonal states. So I could make a state which is now just a product of this one with itself or an outer product with this one, with that one, just to give an example. But the, these states which we are setting up now are linear combinations of these states, yeah? No, you could have, you could, so, so you could have a product of just this one with itself. If you try this one, so you can, if you look at this one, this is just a state which is a product of the qubit zero in system A and qubit zero in system B. So that's just a product of two states. This is also a product of two states. So these states here are just simple product states. This is a linear combination of product states. Yeah, maybe my wording was not, was a little bit confusing. Then, so I'm just gonna list the states and we have a phi minus, which is just given by zero, zero minus one, one and square root of two. And then we have a psi plus here, which is one, zero plus zero, one divided by square root of two and psi minus, which is equal to one, zero, minus zero one divided by square root of two. So it's easy to see that these Bell states form an orthogonal and normalized basis. So this is a small exercise. If you want to convince yourself, show that these states states are orthogonal to each other. They actually form an ONB basis. Now, if you now look at um, uh, these type of systems, if we now want to measure one of the qubits, suppose now that you have a measurement here and what the measurement you make acts on one of these. The specific thing with the Bell states is that measuring this one, which means that your wave function is collapsing to a specific state, means that you will also get information about that one. So we are going to use the states. So these states, which you see here, 
are examples of what we normally will call entangled states. So let me now just look at a specific measurement and let's uh, pick one of the states. And uh, so we can pick the state uh, phi plus, and then we make a measurement on the qubit in subsystem A and make measurement. on qubit in system A. And we can actually decide whether we want to make a measurement on qubit zero or qubit one. On qubit either zero or one in subsystem A. We just write this as an A. So I'm going to define that as an M zero. And we know then that this has to be equal to zero, the projection for system A and this is, in, again, taking the tensor product with system B, which is now an identity matrix or two by two system. So we are only affecting system A. So when we don't do anything on system B, that has to simply be given by an identity matrix. Does that sound plausible? So Can then you, I'm- Teacher, sorry. Can you I, explain more, more that part? Could you say it again? Uh, can can you explain more this part? Okay, so, so I'm clear. I, yeah, so you have a you have a state now. So there's a question if I can explain a little bit more what's going on here, because I'm having a state, which is now given by one, zero zero. That's one of the states, and the other state is, it's a linear combination of these states. So what I want to do now is to make a measurement on the first qubit. So the first qubit, what I'm doing then when I make a measurement, as we discussed last time, a measurement is a projection of a specific state. So if you remember what we discussed last time, we defined these projection operators, P, and one of them could be zero, zero. So if we just have one qubit, and then we had the other operator, which was one, one. So these matrices here, these are just given by one, zero, zero. And this is given by zero, zero, one. And when I then act on a state with this one, a state psi, which is a linear combination of these two. So I could have one, zero, zero, multiplied with alpha, one, zero, plus beta, zero one, what this operator does is that it simply projects out the state zero. So now I want to make a measurement on qubit zero of the subsystem A. And since I'm not affecting subsystem B, then I represent that operation with the identity matrix because nothing happens. So this is the essentially the mathematical expression which we're going to implement. And then I can do the same for system one. Now it's qubit one in system A. So I'm projecting out that specific qubit. And then I have this I times B here. So then I can calculate the probability of zero as we discussed last time. So this is the measurement probability. And when we are running calculations, we are actually going to calculate or we are going to perform measurements on the system. So that means that we are going to project out some specific states. So if I make a measurement now of zero in this subsystem A, I'm going to write this as a pi P of phi of zero. There's a kind of odd notation. And this is my A, B system. And then I have my phi plus. And then I have this operator M zero, and then I have my phi plus and A and B. And if I do that operation, what you will get then when I perform the calculations, so I'm just gonna give you the answer here, is that this is going to be equal to a half. As expected from the definition of the state which we have. So you have a factor of one over square of root of two, and now we are going to get a probability, which is that factor squared. So we get a factor of a half. If I do the same thing 
for the state one, that is simply going to be given by phi plus of a, b, and then I have m1 of phi plus system a, b. And when you set up all the matrices and perform the operations on the state, you will also get a half here. So that means that uh, the state after the measurement is something which now will allow us to tell what is the value of the other qubit. So the specific thing with these Bell states is that when I perform a measurement, we on one of the systems, I can actually tell what state the other system is in because the state collapses to a specific state. So we are going to discuss that after the break. So, and after the break, we will also give a definition of entanglement. And after we've done with that, we are going to look into a discussion of entropies and how these relates to density matrices, et cetera. Any questions so far before we take a break? Yeah. So, could you say it again? The, state zero and one are the qubits or the states of system A. So now, yeah, we have two qubits. Yeah, so, so what I'm doing now is I'm making a measurements on system A and I want to see what's the probability of uh, qubit zero or qubit one in system A. Exactly. 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 So, so the fact that I have this identity matrix on system B means that I don't do anything with system B. Okay. So let's pause the. So what we are going to do now is to. Uh, look a little bit more on the kind of measurements and what they mean. So I will say some of these things through what you find in the slides. So these are the Bell states, which we defined uh, on the whiteboard. You will also find the same states in the Jupyter notebooks. So sometimes, as I said, I use the whiteboard just to slow down the pace. Because if you are like me, when you see too many slides, uh, I, at a certain point, I don't follow anymore. So what we can say uh, is that when we made this measurement uh, on one of these the qubit states, when we now project out, so if we go back to uh, the stuff which we did before the break, this is essentially what we did. This is the projection of the qubit zero, qubit one, on one of the subsystems. And if you then perform this operation, this is how the matrix looks like. And then you have a similar matrix for the projection of qubit one in subsystem A. And if you perform then the operations, this is actually the operation you end up doing. So sometimes I switch back to the Jupyter notebooks because some of these operations are you don't get a much deeper insight by just writing out the matrices. So this gives you a factor of a half, and this gives you a factor of a half. So what you end up with then, and this is the interesting thing, is that after the measurement, and if you remember back what we discussed last week, what we called the post-measurement state. This is the state after the measurement. So when I make a measurement on the state zero, I actually end up with this zero, zero state, which means that I have this state in system A, and then I know that the system B is also in qubit zero. And similarly, if I perform this measurement on qubit one in system A, 
then I know that system B is also in qubit one. So what we see from this is actually very important that the state of the second qubit is determined even though the measurement has only taken place locally on system A. So this is one of these kind of things which we call the wonders of quantum mechanics, which is very difficult to give a kind of intuitive reasoning for. I have developed my intuition by doing linear algebra, but this is not something which falls intuitive to everybody. So other states, uh, if you consider state like this one, as we discussed before the break, this is what we call a pure product state. A state like this one, which we have here, any of these states are called entangled states or just uh, interacting states. You could also call them, call them for that because we have a mixture of different states which could result from some interactions. And these states are then uh, either so-called pure states or states which we call entangled states. So this is just a state which is a direct product of states A and B. Now, if you're used to probabilities, this is a very useful comparison. So let me bring that up because uh, the wave function squared defines a probability. And one of the things you may have encountered when you've taken a course in statistics, so let me just put up a comparison, which we will also use a little bit later. Suppose you have a probability, so this is a probability link, or statistics link actually. So we can have a probability of two random events, X and Y. You could think of these as a Gaussian distribution for X and Y. We would then say that these are identically an independent distribution. So they are identically distributed and you could think of these as independent. In that specific case, we would write this probability since they are identically distributed, we have the same probabilities for X and Y. So this is a product of probabilities. So we would normally call this for I, I, D in statistics. So that means that this independent, we think of these as independent stochastic events and identically distributed. If it's not, then we have a probability, which is a complicated function of X and Y. And then we are no longer talking about identically distributed and independent <coughs> variables. They can be still independent, but they are not identically distributed. So many simple probabilities which we have are simply given as a product of individual probabilities. So if you're familiar with, for instance, the central limit theorem, is everybody familiar with that? That assumes that the individual probabilities are identical and that the variables are independent. Only then can you show that the probability in the limit of many, many events approaches a Gaussian or a normal distribution only if you make this assumption. If you have a probability which can no, not be written out like this, then you cannot prove the central limit theorem, which is an essential theorem in statistics. So when we are dealing with quantum mechanics, this is actually not so different. So if we have non-interacting systems, then the wave functions, if you think of two particles in a harmonic oscillator and these particles don't interact, then the solution, which is the wave function, and the wave function squared as a probability, is simply the product of two individual wave functions. If you have interactions, then the, you cannot separate the degrees of freedom in terms of X and Y, except for some simple quantum mechanical systems, like a harmonic oscillator for two particles. 
in two and three dimensions. That can be solved analytically for a Coulomb interaction because you can separate the central mass motion from the relative motion. So when we are looking at physics, most physical systems, when you have interactions, and this is actually the interesting case, if there was no interaction, life would be pretty boring, right? Most cases which we encounter, we cannot write this. However, the basis which we choose and which we have chosen in these examples, these orthogonal and normalized bases is normally a basis which we call a pure basis, which is now the product of individual computational basis states. So this is a kind of analogy with statistics. And keep in mind that the wave function squared is given a probability interpretation. That was a long digression, sorry for that. Because we will come back to this a little bit later. So that means that we would call this uh, just a direct product state or just a pure state. And quantum states that cannot be written as a mixture of other states are normally called pure quantum states, while all other states are normally called mixed quantum states. And a state like this uh, state here is normally what we call a state which is entangled because this is a linear combination of two states. And this one cannot be written as the product of uh, these orthonormal basis states. Because we have a linear combination of zero, zero, and one, one. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is a very good question, which we also come back to, because uh, we will later say that the pure state is a state which is well defined from the beginning, and then you would call this a pure state. So there is often in the literature, there's a kind of smaller confusion with the labeling of pure. So if you can define the state like we do here now, this is well-defined. That's a good point. So what we say is that the states are entangled and this, uh, this yields the following definition of entangled state, a pure by P part type state uh, is entangled if it cannot be written as a product of the states system A and system B, for any choice of those states. Else we say it's separable. So separable is a better word here because we're gonna use pure states in a slightly different meaning below here. So that's a good question. And just to give you an example, if you think of the helium atom, which is a classical example you meet in atomic physics, you could have uh, systems with spin a half and two spin projections. And then the spin, the two single particle states, they can be written by the tensor products of their spatial 1S states, which I would label like that. And then you could add angular momentum or orbital momentum in this case, and the total spin. So that means that the, the ansatz for the ground state of the helium atom, if you use a compact notation for electron one or two, this is a one electron state, is given by the tensor product of the spatial part with the spin part. And you would write this in a compact notation like this. So it has the 1S state for hydrogen type orbitals, which means that you have orbital momentum equal to zero and the number of nodes equal to zero of the wave function. And then you have spin and the spin projection. So what you see here, is a compact notation like this zero, zero, or zero as we used, but it represents now a tensor product. And then we can make a tensor product when we build a money body state. So in principle, then we would have electron one and electron two here in spin up and spin down. And this is an example of you implementing the anti-symmetry for fermions. This is also an entangled state. So this would be a model for the ground state of the atomic helium, neutral helium. And this ansatz is actually given now by what we simply might call an entangled state. That's just another example. Okay. 
Now, this is an example of a maximal entangled state. Now, one of the things I wanted to say a little bit about, and let's see how time is evolving here. Maybe, uh, maybe I should come back to that because I wanted to say something about entropy first. Yeah. So I'm going to do something uh, uh, a little bit odd because I wanted to mention entropy first and uh, then come back to this Schmidt decomposition. So the Schmidt decomposition is a technicality. But now I wanted to say a little bit about entropy. So entropy uh, in quantum mechanics is actually something which we use as a measure of entanglement. So let me try to give you a motivation for why we have these specific expressions for the entropy. And then I'm going back to how we can calculate the entropy using the density matrix, okay? So I wanted to start with entropy first. Then let me just move to the whiteboard again. So the um, topic I want to say a little bit about is entropy. And you're probably familiar with entropy from physics, or if you've taken a course in information theory, you have encountered an expression for the entropy for a given a variable X, which is given by the sum over all the possible events you have. So this is an uppercase X. And then we have the probabilities for this type of variables times X. And then it can be log two, it can be log 10. This just gives you a multiplicative factor. So which kind of log scale you use, it's just a multiplicative factor. And you've probably seen this equation here, right? So this is an uppercase X. And this is a probability of the set of events X. And I'm summing over all the individual events X. So the kind of assumption uh, I'm making here is there is a set of uh, events, which is given by this uppercase X. These are random events. And then the individual ones are given, hopefully you can see the distinction between an uppercase letter and a lowercase letter. Now, if you look at this distinction, you may now ask, why do we use that as a measure? What does it actually measure? Why do we have this information? Why do we have this uh, quantity here? So what I'm doing here is I'm considering, let me just write down a random variable. X, which is an element in this set X, with a probability which I label as a P of X of X. This quantity here, if you now take away physics, is normally called the uh, Shannon entropy or the Shannon information entropy, or just the Shannon entropy. Why did we cook up this expression? What kind of, uh, what kind of uh, things do we want to express with the entropy? So you don't need to think of physics. Any good ideas? I'm just asking you why, why do we have that expression? Say, say it again. Randomness is one thing. You have the probability. That's, that's correct. Yeah. It looks also like a mean value, but there are other things you want to express. So you want to have a kind of measure of something which is very likely and something which is less likely. So you could say, if there is a possibility of only one, so that means P of X or, or P, of, sorry, this is I actually, I'm missing. I have a small typo here, sorry for that. I saw that first now. Sorry. 
This is actually very important. This omission. So if you see something wrong, please <laughs> don't believe everything I write down there. Eh? Now, what I want to have a measure is the one thing I would like to is to have something which expresses the degree of uncertainty. So if I'm very certain about something, I could say I want to have the value zero. So that means if the probability is equal to one, so that means the probability of me actually standing here today is one because I'm here now, then you know that I am here. And this is not a very interesting case. So maybe I would like to have something which then expresses uh, the, uh, or magnifies the uh, degree of unlikelihood. So if, if something is very likely, then I want this to be small because then I'm certain. It's just a measure. So when people came up with the expression for the entropy, they were looking after a measurement or some kind of measure of uh, uncertainty. So you want to flag if something is uncertain that the value is large or unlikely, it's perhaps a better word. So if you now look at the, what people started with, they didn't start with this expression here, which looks like an expectation value, but they started with uh, uh, something which uh, just contained the log function. So I'm just gonna give you some small keywords because there's a lot of intuition uh, behind the entropy concept, uh, which is not directly linked with physics immediately. But when you think a little bit about it, then it contains a lot of the same information or actually the same information. This is a classical quantity. And if you uh, look at what you want to, so in the beginning, what many people suggested was to have a measure of something which is unlikely, of the unlikeliness. So you could think of a function which goes like this, of p of x, of x. So if you make a plot of that function, then what you would have is something which looks like this, p of x. You have one here, we're assuming that the probabilities are normalized. So this is i of x. And since we have the minus, it means that the value becomes positive. And remember now that this takes values between zero and one, the probability is normalized. So you could have something like this. And you see now that when it goes to one, this quantity goes to zero. So that means that when it's, uh, when this measure is zero, then we know that there is only one possibility. Yeah. Yeah. It diverges, it diverges. Yeah, it's negative, right? It's negative. So P of X takes values between zero and one. We assume that it's normalized. So this is a possibility. The only problem now is that it diverges, right? Then uh, what you could think of is another property. Uh, so obviously you want to have it non-negative. That's an important property. And often probabilities are additive or, or, the, or the log is an additive function. So if you go back to this case with P of X, one and x2 here equal to a p of x1, p of x2. Then this equation here, i of x1 of x2 is additive because then it's just simply equal to minus log two of p of x1 plus or actually minus log two of p of x2. And we can simply write this as i of x1 plus this i of x2. So that's another property we want to have, but the better measurement is actually the so-called Shannon entropy or the expression which we are familiar with, 
And if you look at an example of a binary system, you will see immediately why. So let's take a binary system. And in that case, we have x equal to zero, lives between zero and one. And I have my p of x for x being equal to zero, which is equal to p, just a constant. And p of x of one, the other endpoint, which is just one minus p. Then I know that in the limit, if I take this log function, which I have, if I take epsilon goes to zero, and epsilon of log two or any of the logs, this goes actually to zero. So if I then define the entropy for this binary case, this would actually be given by minus p of log two times p minus one minus p of log two of one minus p. So what I would have then is the following. So I have zero, and this is the value of the probability. So probability 0.5. When I have probability here and one, zero and one, then this entropy, this is one here, then this entropy is exactly zero. So that means that these are the two cases, the binary cases, they are well determined. These cases have no uncertainty. And that has zero entropy. And then if I plot it, this curve is gonna look like this. So when it's 0.5, then there's a 50-50 of being in one of the states or in the other ones. And for this binary system, we would call this maximum uncertainty, right? So people actually historically played around with these different expressions in order to find a measurement for unlikeliness. So if you're zero and one, you know exactly where you are. There is no uh, uncertainty. Whereas when you are in 0.5 for this binary system, then you have a mixing of the two states. Okay, so it's a measurement of unlikeliness. Now, this doesn't include quantum mechanics, right? This is a classical entropy. So what we are going to do now is to introduce the so-called von Neumann entropy. And I'm going to show you why this, this specific expression is going to give us something which, so what we want is something which looks like a probability. So the expression we want now is this S of X. This is the uppercase X for the domain of events which we have, minus P of X of X times log two or log 10 or any of these guys. This is the classical expression, and this is called the Shannon entropy. Now, the quantum mechanical variant is called the von Neumann entropy. Now, pay attention to what we have here. We have a probability and a probability. So can we get a quantum mechanical variant which contains probability and probability. You can that if you define the von Neumann entropy in terms of the density matrix. So let me see how that comes through. So the quantum mechanical equivalent is what is called the von Neumann entropy. So this looks like as follows. So let me just take my notes here. So the way we are gonna define it is as follows. So this is the quantum mechanical uh, for a given density matrix. So I have a density matrix of a system A. 
So A stands for a system. And this is going to be given by minus the trace. And I have to show you why this gives a probability. So row of A, this is a density matrix. Log, this can be log two, log 10, like that. And the density matrix is now given in terms of a probability, lambda j. This is a probability, remember that for the density matrix, times a psi of j, system A, and a psi of j of system A. So this is the projection operator. And we have a probability for being in that specific state, which is lambda j. So remember that the expectation value of the density matrix as an operator gives a probability. So this is a, this eigenvalue is a probability. So if you look at this one, hey, how can I go from that one to something which looks like that? Another thing I want to have as well is that this S of X, or let's just X of X or A, uh, when P of X is equal to one, or P of X is equal to zero, it should be uh, well-defined. We want that to be zero, should be zero, because there's no uncertainty. Another property we want is also that this is going to define an object, which hopefully is positive definite or semi-positive definite. So the question is, how do we get from the expression you see here to this expression or something which looks like that? So what I'm going to do now is actually to show you how you can go from that to here and where these probabilities are the probabilities which we have in a density matrix. Okay. So this is just the a small set of manipulations we need. And so the lambda j's, just keep that in mind, are the eigenvalues, are the, the eigenvalues. Actually, these are probabilities of being in a specific state. And these states, this psi of J of system A, these are the corresponding orthogonal eigenvectors. And in our case, these eigenvectors will also be normalized in general, are the corresponding O and Bs, corresponding, corresponding O and Bs, of the density matrix. So this a quantity rho of A, the density matrix, is in principle a semi-positive definite matrix, which means that the eigenvalues of the density matrix are larger or equal than zero. That's also a very important property. So let me just state that is what we call semi-positive definite which means that the eigenvalues are larger or equal than zero. And another thing, so I'm just stating a property and it is always diagonalizable. So we can always diagonalize it and find the eigenvalues. Always diagonalizable. That helps us in showing the relation we want to do. Because if it can be diagonalized, it means that I can find a nice unitary transformation which makes the matrix diagonal. Remember, as some of you pointed out in the, before the break, that the density matrix is not necessarily diagonal. It has non-diagonal elements. But that means that I can find some kind of transformation here where I take rho i prime of u 
which then becomes diagonal. So that means that I could say that this one is now given, so rho of A, which I have on the left side is my original matrix, but then there is a diagonal matrix, D of A. So this diagonal matrix, D of A, contains now just the eigenvalues, lambda zero, lambda one, down to lambda n minus one. So I haven't showed you that the density matrix is always diagonalizable, but you can actually prove that. So I'm just using that property. So with that, I can now, and we know that if I take u of u, this is the same as u, and this is gives us just the identity matrix. Then if I take this quantity u of log, no, sorry, rho, so I'm just gonna show you this rho of a times log, can take log two. I'm just gonna skip the two here, right? I hope you don't get offended if I skip it because we can choose whatever one, we, we, whatever base we want. It's just a scaling factor. Thanks. So if I take and transform this one, then what I can do is simply to insert here a u times that one, okay? So then what I get, I have this one transformed. So this can be transformed to the diagonal piece. And since I'm performing this transformation, which actually diagonalizes the log, and I'm not showing you all the details, but you can show that, that this can be rewritten like the log of the diagonal matrix element. It's actually not so difficult to do that. You just need to take the exponential and then take the log of the exponential and then you have the proof. It's a pretty easy to show that, but I'm just stating that. So this means that I am performing a operation here where I have a transformation which renders this one diagonal. So this is going to give, give me log D of A. So what I, I'm gonna have now is log of lambda zero down to log log of lambda n minus one, zero and zero. Another thing which we should keep in mind is also that the trace of this diagonal matrix here is just the sum of the eigenvalues. another property. So what I can say then, when I look at this expression here, is that what I've done now with these ingredients is actually that this becomes the trace of D of A of log of D of A. And that is again the trace, or rather, if you just write it out, in explicit details, this is just the sum of i equals zero to n minus one. And then I have a lambda of i of log of lambda of i. And these are probabilities. So this becomes again, i equals zero to n minus one, probability p of i log p of i, since p of i is a probability. So then starting, so what I did was to start not with this expression, but I actually started with this expression, which we have here, the trace of the density matrix. Then by taking the trace of the density matrix and using the fact that this is always diagonalizable, then I can find the eigenvalues by a specific transformation. And then I can simply show that what I get now is this expression here, and that becomes a probability times the log of a probability. And that is the quantum equivalent of the Shannon entropy. And this is the quantity which we now 
are going to evaluate for that specific two qubit system. So I can see from your faces now that you're on the brink of saturation, some of you, I am. And uh, next week, uh, I think I was a little bit too ambitious today because I wanted to now calculate. So what the thing we are going to do next time is to calculate the trace of the density matrix of a given subsystem. So we are going to calculate that one, subsystem A. So we have a system composed of A and B. And we are going to calculate the entropy of system A. And we are going to look at what happens for that simple model when it comes to the entropy of a subsystem. So if you go back to the Jupyter notebook, and this is the part which I partly knew I wouldn't reach today. So we will discuss that next week. But if you scroll down uh, in this specific example, you will see this system here. And I'm actually calculating the entropy of a subsystem. And this entropy increases when I turn on the interaction, which is what happens when I have this level crossing. So next week, I will show you how you calculate the entropy of the subsystem and what this means. So now I'm just leaving you a little bit in suspension here. This is like you guys watching this TV series. You are waiting hungrily for the next episode. And what we are going to do next time is actually to calculate the entropy of the subsystem. And uh, I will probably need the first hour of next lecture to discuss this. And then after that, we are going to look at the specific quantum gates, which we can start implementing. And I need also to say a little bit about what this entropy means in connection with entanglement. Why is this a measure of entanglement? This is something which I haven't mentioned. So I've just gone through a technicality today. So next week, I will also discuss this in connection with a way or a measure for entanglement. So this is the thing, one of the details which I haven't given you yet. Why do we, are we doing this? So we have a quantum mechanical variant and we can use that as a measure for entanglement. There are many measures for entanglement, but the von Neumann entropy is one of them. And this link with the avoided level crossing is something we often are looking after in physical systems in order to realize quantum operations. And this is where we'll stop today. Teacher, I have a, a question. This is a question, it's a curiosity. Like uh, the definition